So our message today is the high calling of being a royal priesthood for a section not all alone. In today's passage from 1 Peter 2, there's an emphasis on being a royal priesthood. One aspect of being a priest is making intercession for others. In prayer meeting lately, we've been working through the book of Exodus, and we saw Moses stand in the gap for the rest of the people when they sinned by worshiping a golden calf. He pleaded with God for their forgiveness, even to the point of offering to have his own name blotted from the book God had written if they were not to be forgiven, Exodus 32, 32. Uh, Moses was willing to be associated with their sin if it would mean they could be forgiven. Although his brother Aaron was technically the high priest, Moses' action was priestly in terms of interceding for others who had sinned. As Christians, part of our priestly role is to sympathize with others, to, to come alongside them and plead to God on their behalf. Jesus died, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. Here's a humorous story that sort of gets at this aspect of standing with others so they're not left all alone. A priest was giving his homily, preaching to his congregation concerning heaven and hell. To emphasize the difference between the two, he asked that all who wanted to go to heaven to stand up. Of course, all the congregation rose. He then asked all who wanted to go to hell to stand up. No one stood up. For full dramatic impact, he waited for several seconds before continuing. But during that pause, a small boy slowly rose to his feet. The astonished priest spoke to the boy, Surely a fine young man like yourself doesn't want to go to hell. The boy answered, well, of course not, but I just couldn't stand the sight of you standing there all alone. <laughs> Seeking the author behind the letter. We live in an era of instant communication. You send a text or a direct message and boom, the other person receives a ding and can read it right away. It wasn't always thus. Back in the old days, people used to have to take a pen and a piece of paper, laboriously write out what they wanted to say, put it in an envelope, address it, put a stamp on it, walk it out to the mailbox, and wait for the mail carrier to pick it up. Some days later, the other person would receive it. Then you'd have to wait until they went through the reverse procedure to get your reply. Now, if you were in love, those letters became very precious to you, especially if you were far away and the mail took a long time to come. We treasured the letters from our loved ones. It's not that the letter itself was that valuable commercially, but it represented your girlfriend or boyfriend or relatives that couldn't be there with you. Peter begins chapter 2 by describing how this applies in our relationship to the Lord. Why do we read the Bible? Is it just to tank up on spiritual information? The internet is crammed full of spiritual information from all kinds of sources, much of it not from God. Do we read our Bible solely to learn more ancient wisdom? There are many other ancient writers, so that alone wouldn't be motivating for a daily quiet time. We read the Bible to connect with its author. Note verses 2 and 3. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Take that piece by piece backwards. First, we have tasted that the Lord is good. Before we were saved, our appetite for the things of Christ was lacking. The Holy Spirit awakened in us spiritual taste buds, so our yearning for God came alive. We could actually taste that he was good. He alone had the words of life. We came to see Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life. Next, because we've tasted he's good, we then crave pure spiritual milk, as Peter puts it. The tasting feeds the craving. We want more. The phrase spiritual milk can also be translated milk of the word. 
rational feeding. We want to know more about Jesus and the Christian life, how practically to live day to day. There's a logical worldview presented in Scripture about origins, destiny, morality, and meaning. It kind of gives sense to life. That takes time to understand, and gradually it begins to come together to form a meaningful worldview. We're reading devotionally as well as intellectually, getting to know God personally, hearing his voice, picking out his promises for us. Peter says in this phase, we're like newborn babies. We need desperately to be fed and nurtured. What's that enable? Peter says at the end of verse 2, so that by it, the pure spiritual milk, you may grow up in your salvation. We don't stay babies, spiritual infants. God wants us to be more mature than tipsy toddlers. His Holy Spirit is transforming our character to be more like Jesus. So craving the word is instrumental in making verse 1 possible. That said, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. That's real behavioral change. We become more real, less hypocritical, fake, deceitful, putting on a false front. Craving scriptural truth as a means to get to know God results in less envy, jealousy, wanting things that aren't for us. Taste that the Lord is good. Crave his pure milk in the word. Thus satisfied in our core, we don't need the stuff other people have to try to make us feel like we're enough because we're already treasured by God. Growing stones, supportive, not static. Ah, spring, it will officially be here in about another week. We've had little tastes of it here and there. Today the clocks did their spring ahead an hour to take advantage of lengthening daylight. We anticipate seeing robins return soon, we hope. I see some people have seen robins, anybody? Some? Yeah, okay, great, that's wonderful. On the farm growing up, one job that came around every spring was picking stones. Dad had named our farm Marlfield from a Scottish term meaning stony field. So every year, us three boys and dad would walk the fields behind the old blue flatbed truck, tossing stones and larger boulders onto it to dump over by a ditch or a culvert. No matter whether we'd just done it the year before, every year there were fresh stones to pick. Dad used to talk about one of his uncles who once asked with incredulity, don't you know stones grow? In verses 4 to 8, the Apostle Peter uses this imagery of stones to communicate the stability and support Jesus gives to our lives when we trust in him. And in turn, the substance our own lives can bring to Christ's church. Peter's basing it on the Hebrew scriptures and Jesus' own self-understanding informed by the prophets. Verse 6, Peter quotes Isaiah 28, 16. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. In this passage, Isaiah is referring to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. God the Father says Jesus is chosen and precious, like the most important stone in a house's foundation, with reference to which all the other stones line up and depend upon. Knowing Jesus, we can be assured our sins are forgiven through his accomplishment at Calvary. In him, we have confidence. We will not be ashamed or condemned. Is Jesus the bedrock, the foundation of your life? If not, what else are you trying to depend upon? Peter goes on to quote Psalm 118.22, which the Lord Jesus himself cited when confronting those who opposed him. Peter adds Isaiah 8.14, which depicts the problems those have who do not put their faith in Christ. Verses 7-8. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, here's the Psalm 118, 
the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And, and this Isaiah quote, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Now, it's, it's the stumbling for all who disobey they were destined for, not necessarily the disobedience itself. Now, the picture we have in our minds of a stone is probably static, unmoving. A, a stone just kind of sits there. If you walk into it in the dark, you would stub your toe, if not stumble and fall. That's the connotation of strength and stability Peter's conveying by talking about a cornerstone. But Peter refers to Jesus and us in a way that doesn't stop at being static. He talks about living stones. Yes, that's right. Let me take a moment for you to accept that combination mentally. A stone that's actually alive. No, we don't mean Dwayne Johnson. Such stones are more supportive in their liveliness, meant to come alongside and be together, helping others, making a contribution. See verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the living stone we come to by faith. He makes us to be living stones, not to remain on our own, alone, isolated, but to be put together, assembled, built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. When stones are put together by a mason into a building, they become a unit, working together, each one lending strength and stability to the structure. The building becomes stronger because of the many stones than it would be with just one stone. Think of the, the great cathedrals in Europe and the UK. Now, back up a moment and think about the capstone or keystone the psalmist referred to, which Peter quoted in verse 7. Consider the stone arch above a gothic stained glass window. The capstone at the top of the arch is a weird shape. It's not square like many of the other stones. It's unique. Jesus didn't fit the expectations many of his contemporaries had of what Messiah would be like. They hoped for a conquering king to restore ownership of their homeland. He came as a non-political, suffering savior, very different from what they had been hoping for. Yet his resurrection confirmed he was, in fact, the Messiah sent to deliver us from slavery to sin. Now, this weird-shaped capstone is at the top of the arch. Imagine it from a load-bearing point of view, like you have a roof above with a heavy accumulation of snow or ice pressing down on the building or a high wind threatening to push the building over. What does the capstone do? Well, it distributes the load. The stones above it just have to transmit the load pressing on them down to the next layer below, but the capstone has to divide the load, distribute it sideways to the stones heading down the side of the arch without crumbling or getting budged this way or that. Jesus bore the penalty that should have come to us sinners, diverting it, sparing us the full weight of God's wrath, a most unique and irreplaceable role. Head back now to verse 5. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. We're to be living stones like Jesus is. We're being built into a spiritual house. We're not just in it for ourselves. How can we help others bear the load? What's our role in distributing the weight so the building doesn't crumble? Does the capstone imagery give you a more dynamic understanding of what it means to be built together with others into a spiritual house. What's Paul getting at in Galatians 6 2? 
carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Ooh, Christ's law is carrying others' burdens. Are we helping them shoulder their load somehow? Or just concerned about ourselves? That's ah, their own business. Is it a Romans 15, 1? We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Ouch. But, 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 but pleasing ourselves is what this culture is all about. Bear with the failings of the weak. Isn't their weakness their own fault? That's not the point. The apostle is saying we should be using our strength to bear with others' failings. To me, that sounds like capstone work, distributing the load, bearing more than just my own share at times. We all have our own weak moments, and we sure appreciate help then. An exhausted housewife dragged herself to the telephone when it rang and listened with relief to the kindly voice on the other end, which she took to be her mum. How are you, sweetheart? What kind of day are you having? Oh, mother, said the woman, I'm having such a bad day. The baby won't eat. The washing machine broke down. The house is a mess. We're having two couples over for dinner tonight, and I haven't had a chance to go shopping yet. And to top it off, I just sprained my ankle. The mother was overwhelmed with sympathy. Oh, honey, she said, sit down, relax, and just close your eyes. I'll be over in half an hour. I'll do the shopping, clean the house, and cook your dinner for you. I'll feed the baby, and I'll call a repairman to fix the washing machine. Now stop crying. I'll do everything. In fact, I'll even call John at the office and ask him to come home and help out. John, said the housewife. Who's John? John, your husband. Isn't this 555-1265? No, it's 555-1264. Oh, said the kindly person, I must have the wrong number. There was a long silence. And the overwhelmed, helpless woman asked, does this mean you're not coming over? <laughs> you are on God's wanted list. Remember those wanted posters in old Western movies? Wanted, dead or alive for robbing stagecoaches, etc. Did you know you are on God's most wanted list? Verse 4, Peter notes Jesus, the living stone, is rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. Chosen and precious. Chosen means picked out, selected especially. The other word can mean held in honor, prized, precious. Do you have any prized possessions that are most dear to you? I know what Gollum would choose. What's your precious? Jesus was most dear to the Father. At his baptism, God announced, Matthew 3.17, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And at the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter and the other two disciples present heard God say, Matthew 17.5, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. The father seemed to be loving on the son verbally whenever there was opportunity. But then Peter starts talking about us who believe in Jesus in the same way, that we are God's chosen ones, special to him. Uh, verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God, God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Hear that? You are chosen, selected, picked especially. You belong to God. You are God's people, having received his mercy. When you are in Christ by faith, the same love God the Father has for Jesus becomes yours as well in him. Why? To what end? Peter says that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Declare his praises. Declare how prized and precious he is to you. 
What's it like being in his light compared to former days being in the darkness without forgiveness, without grace, fighting to survive in the world just on your own merit? Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. We have tasted that the Lord is good and righteous and true. Now we are light in the Lord, empowered to show forth his qualities to those around us. Next, priestly privilege and sacrifices for the era of grace. We began with the story of the little boy standing up so the priest wouldn't be going to hell on his own, he thought. The boy's impulse was priestly, wanting to be there for the other person, moving toward them in their plight. We saw in verse 5 that according to Peter, we are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. Peter comes back to this in verse 9 when he says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. What's he getting at here? We know Jesus is our mediator, our, our great high priest, see the letter to the Hebrews, but what's our priestly role? What's this business about offering spiritual sacrifices he's getting at in verse 5? Peter's not alone in using these terms. John writes in Revelation 1, 5, and 6, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Peter's phrase, a royal priesthood, could also be rendered a kingdom of priests. What would our priestly duties be? In the Old Testament, the priest accepted the sacrifice from a worshiper and offered it at the altar on their behalf. The high priest once a year entered the most holy place to make atonement for the people, sprinkling blood at the Ark of the Covenant, specifically its lid, the atonement cover or mercy seat. Priestly duties also included tending the lamps in the holy place, burning incense, and placing fresh showbread on the table daily. Priests pronounced blessings in God's name and declared people clean when they were healed of skin diseases. So priests interceded for the people and represented them, acted in their stead as go-betweens between the people and God. How might the Lord be wanting us to act as go-betweens for our neighbors, to be interceding for them? to be representing God to them in a world where media seems to avoid mention of God like the plague? Do we even know our neighbors well enough to be aware of what their concerns and fears might be? Are we there for them or just preoccupied with pleasing ourselves? Peter says as priests, we are to be offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He doesn't mean burning livestock, does he, like they used to in the old tabernacle in Jerusalem? No. Consider what Paul writes in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here, one sacrifice we offer as a royal priesthood is our bodies, living sacrifices. We put all we are on the altar figuratively. I am thine, O Lord. Another sacrifice is our thought life, not conforming to the world's pattern, but having our mind renewed by reading and meditating on his word in the Bible. Learn to think the way Jesus would think. How would Jesus approach this situation? What's most important to him in this scenario? What impact would 
goodness, righteousness, and truth have. Another helpful verse is Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. So praise is a sacrifice. Not just when things are going well. It's when things aren't going in the way you want, but you can still praise God anyway that it becomes a real sacrifice very special to your Heavenly Father because it shows you're trusting Him to bring you through. People's New Testament commentary summarizes the sacrifices of the Christian priest are prayer, praise, good deeds, the consecration of our bodies and substance to God's service. A section, you put your whole self in. A couple of quick illustrations as we close. In a church service one Sunday, the offering plate came to a little girl at the end of a row. She took the plate, put it down on the floor, and stood in it. When the usher asked her what she was doing, she responded, Well, in Sunday school, I learned that I was supposed to give myself to God. She was illustrating Romans 12, 1, offering her body as a living sacrifice. And here's some encouragement to be carrying out the priestly duty of prayer right in our own homes. Chaplain Richard Halverson of the United States Senate told the story of a time when the subject of prayer in schools came up just before a senator was to give a speech to several hundred men at a church's annual men's dinner. In response to the senator's question about how many of the churchgoers believed in prayer in the public schools, nearly every man present raised his hand in the affirmative. And the senator asked, how many of you pray daily with your own children in your home? This time, only a few hands were raised. Let's pray. Lord, we have tasted and we know you are good. Thank you for making us a royal priesthood, for breathing life into these stony hearts so we can become living stones. Help us keep our lives built upon Jesus Christ, the only really reliable cornerstone. Help us see how we can bear the load of others rather than just pleasing ourselves. Make us more conscious of our priestly privilege, forgiven, accounted worthy to access your most holy place. Give us hearts that care about others and yearn to bring them to you. In Jesus' name, amen.